It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. After decades of sustained attacks on social programs and consistently high unemployment rates, it is no surprise that mortality rates in the country has increased. A research team from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health in New York has estimated that 875,000 deaths in the United States in year 2000 could be attributed to clusters of social factors bound up with poverty and income inequality. According to U.S. government statistics, some 2.45 million Americans died in year 2000. Thus, the researchers estimate means that social deprivation was responsible for some 36 percent of the total deaths that year, a staggering total. Now joining us to discuss all of this from New York City is Michael Hudson. Michael is a distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. His latest book is Killing the Host, How Financial Parasites and Debt Bondage Destroy the Global Economy. Michael, good to have you with us. Good to be back here. So, Michael, what do you make of these uh, recent uh, research and what it's telling us about the death total in this country? What it tells is almost identical to what uh, has already been narrated for Russia uh, and Greece. And uh, what's responsible for the increasing death rates is uh, actually neoliberal economic policy, uh, neoliberal trade policy, and the polarization and impoverishment of a large part of society. Uh, after uh, the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, uh, death rates soared, lifespans shortened, uh, health uh, standards decreased uh, all th throughout the Yeltsin administration until finally uh, uh, President Putin came in and stabilized matters. Uh, Putin thought, said that the destruction caused by neoliberal economic policies had killed more Russians than all of uh, whom died in World War II, uh, the 22 million people. That's uh, the devastation that uh, polarization caused there. Same thing in Greece. Uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, Greek life lifespans are shortened. Uh, the, uh, they're getting uh, sicker. Uh, they're dying faster. Uh, they're not healthy. Uh, almost all of the British economists of the uh, late 18th century said, uh, when you have uh, poverty, when you have a transfer of wealth to the rich, uh, you're going to have shorter lifespans, and uh, you're also going to have uh, an emigration. Uh, the countries that have a hard money policy, a creditor policy, uh, people are going to emigrate. Now, at that time, that was why England was gaining immigrants. It was gaining skilled labor. It was gaining uh, people to work in its industry because other countries uh, were still in the post-feudal uh, system and were driving them out. Uh, Russia had a huge emigration of skilled labor, largely to uh, Germany and to the United States, especially of information technology. Uh, Greece has a, a heavy outflow of labor. Uh, the Baltic states have had a uh, almost a 10% decline in their population in the last decade as a result of their ne neoliberal policies. Uh, also, uh, health problems are rising. Now, the question is, uh, in America, now that you're having, as a result of this polarization, uh, shorter lifespans, worse, worse health, worse diets, where are the Americans going to emigrate? Uh, nobody can figure that one out yet. Uh, there no, seems nowhere for them to go because they don't speak a foreign language. Uh, the Russians, the Greeks, uh, most Europeans uh, all somehow have to learn English in school. What's your question for the Prime Minister? Um, the question is, do you regret the personal damage that your scaremongering campaign has done to your reputation and legacy? Personal damage. Well, James, with, with respect, I just don't agree. I think there's a very positive case for staying in a reformed European Union. It's about jobs. It's about Britain's strength and place in the world. It's about keeping us safe. But I do think there are real risks from leaving. And I don't want to wake up on June the 24th. Well, I don't, accept, I don't accept it's scaremongering, sir. I, I am genuinely worried about Britain leaving the single market. Given recent exchanges over the last few weeks, do you still think that Boris Johnson would make a good prime minister? 
I think Boris is a very talented politician. He was a great mayor of London, and I've always said he's got a huge amount to give to public service and public life. I don't get to pick uh, the next prime minister. Um, that will be a decision made by uh, the party and by the country when the country votes. And so I'm not going to put the black spot on anyone by saying who should or shouldn't do the job, but he's a very talented guy. On this issue, we disagree. I really think we'd be making a big mistake as a country. Does that work for you, Fiona? I don't quite answered the question. You haven't answered the question. The question was, do I think Boris should be the next Prime Minister? I'm saying I'm not going to... I've said he's been a great Mayor of London, he's got plenty of left fuel in the tank, and I'll let other people decide. And that's as far as I'm going to go. No, 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 no. Let me finish now, because I've seen you interrupt many people beforehand. Let me finish now. That is not answering the question. I was going to do Turkey, if you want me to do Turkey. I'm an English literature student. I know waffling when I see it, Okay. I'm sorry. How can you reassure yes. the people who do want to vote out, because I have many friends who want to vote out, that we are safe from extremism when we are willing to work with a government fr- like okay, Turkey, Turkey who want to be part of the EU when, like I said, they are under heavy accusation. Okay, which okay I got it. I got it. It's like Saudi right. Arabia who we sell military Sarai, arms okay. to. Sarai, we're going to run out I'll, really quick, on, I'll be really quick on Turkey. There is no prospect of Turkey joining the EU in decades. They applied in 1987. They have to complete 35 chapters. One has been completed so far. At this rate, they'll join in the year 3000. You said that uh, Sadiq Khan wasn't to be trusted a few weeks ago. And then a couple of weeks later, you appear on a platform with him. Isn't that an example of your hypocrisy and scaremongering over the course of this campaign? Obviously, I don't think so, and I'll try and convince you why uh, it was the right thing to do. Look, we had a lively election campaign in London. I think some of the people he chose to share a platform with, I didn't think it was the right choice, and I criticised that. Questions were asked of him, but he was elected by the people of London, and I think the right thing for a Prime Minister to do is to work with an elected Mayor of London for the good of people in London. There's a lot of stuff we're going to have to do together. Let's try and improve the transport system. Let's make sure we have cleaner air. Let's make sure we have good public services. Now, Sadiq and I disagree about many things. We'll try and work together. But on this issue of Europe, we agree. On Britain's streets, tempers are becoming frayed as make your mind up time approaches. So what? So what? Nobody was working around before you were come about. You changed the words. Changed the words. At the heart of the debate, fears Europe's freedom of movement rules mean UK immigration is out of control. The latest figures show a third of a million more people came to live in the UK last year than left to live abroad, up 20,000 on the year before. Nearly half, 184,000 from the EU, but 4,000 more came from outside Europe. They're the kind of figures that pressured UK Prime Minister David Cameron in the 2010 general election to promise an in-out referendum. Are we all for Brexit? Campaigning under the slogan, we want our country back, the anti-EU argument has struck a chord. I voted yes to join in the 70s a six-country trading agreement, not to be this huge um, governmental system that's becoming out of control. This is the last period, last time to control the immigration in this country. Otherwise, this country will be lost everything. In the fields of northern England, however, concern a steady supply of workers from the EU would suddenly dry up, creating a labour shortage. My biggest worry about Brexit in terms of workforce is access to labour. You know, without the labour, I can't do the job I need to do. Here in Scotland, they're already talking about making another break for independence should the rest of the UK vote to leave the European Union. I voted yes anyway for independence, so I would, I would hope so, yes. The EU isn't great, but in fact, it's kind of rubbish, but it's not as bad as the UK government. If we break from Europe, then we'll definitely go for another referendum. And with the EU suffering economic malaise and high unemployment, and its southern borders gripped in an unprecedented migrant crisis, there are fears for the future of the wider European enterprise. The stakes in Britain's EU referendum really couldn't be greater. 
Richard Bestick, CCTV, London. Zahraniční politice je jenom jediná temná skvrna a tou je migrační vlna. Politici, kteří zavírají oči před tím, že se k nám tato migrační vlna ještě nepředila a že se proto není čeho obávat, mi trochu připomínají jednoho bývalého pražského primátora. Tento primátor v době povodní stál na mostě a říkal, situace je nadmíru výtečná. A dvě hodiny poté voda zalila pražské metro. Někdy si připadám jako Kassandra, která varuje před vtažením trojského koně do města, ale jsem hluboce přesvědčen o tom, že to, čemu čelíme, je organizovaná invaze a nikoli spontánní pohyb uprchlíků. Ti, kdo se zastávají imigrantů, mluví o soucitu a solidaritě. Soucit je možný u starých, nemocných a především u dětí. Ale velká většina nelegálních imigrantů jsou mladí, zdraví muži bez rodin. A já se ptám, proč tito muži nevezmou do ruky zbraň a nebojují za svobodu své země proti islámskému státu. Jejich útěk objektivně posiluje islámský stát. A já si nedovedu představit, že v době, kdy z protektorátu prchali naši mladí muži, prchali proto, aby ve Velké Británii dostávali sociální dávky. Prchali proto, aby bojovali za svobodu své země. A to tež samozřejmě platí i pro ty, kdo odcházejí ze zemí, kde se nebojuje. Protože jejich odchod odsuzuje tyto země k další zaostalosti. Když se připravovala demonstrace zastánců migrace, 17. listopadu, tak jsem od jedné z našich spravodajských služeb dostal informaci, že na transparentu této demonstrace má být nápis Tahle země není naše refugees welcome. Potom někdo poradil těmto organizátorům, že ten nápis je mimořádně hloupý a tak ho nahradili o něco méně hloupým nápisem. Tahle země patří všem. Refugees, welcome. A závěrem svého vánočního poselství bych vám chtěl říct si dvě jasné věty. Tahle země je naše. A tahle země není a ani nemůže být pro všechny. Milí přátelé, šťastný a veselý nový rok. this out and the amazing thing what's going to make this worse is the uh, trade uh, the trans-pacific trade agreement and uh, the uh, uh, counterpart with the Atlantic states and uh, in today's news there is uh, news that President Obama plans to make a big push for the trans-pacific trade agreement essentially uh, the, the giveaway 
to corporations, uh, preventing governments from environmental protection, preventing them from uh, imposing health standards, preventing them from having cigarette warnings or warning about bad food. Uh, Obama says he wants to push this in after the election. Here in Britain, we are about to vote in a watershed referendum in which we're being asked to permanently hand over all our political power to people who've been wrong about everything so that they can rule over us like kings. Sound like a deal? It's not being presented to us in exactly those terms, of course, because, well, because we're being conned. That's right, we're being swindled out of our sovereignty, our democracy, our security and our freedom by corrupt, self-serving career politicians who've never had a real job between them. Some of my American friends seem to think that the European Union is a kind of United States of Europe, and therefore a good thing. In fact, it's more akin to a new Soviet Union, and that's why Britain needs to get out. It doesn't have a constitution that guarantees fundamental liberties and government by consent, because its primary purpose is to eliminate the need for democratic consent to empower politicians at the people's expense and to make them our rulers, not our servants. Career politicians hate democracy because it holds them to account, at least up to a point. It means that every few years they have to justify themselves to plebs like you and me. It must infuriate them to think that their influential, well-paid jobs and their grand utopian political projects depend entirely on the shallow opinions of idiots like us. Of course they're going to try to remove us from the equation. We are the problem. The European Union was designed from the outset to take care of that problem by removing the people from the governing process entirely so that career politicians and their friends in big business could form a cosy cartel for their mutual convenience. This is why small business in the European Union is buried under an avalanche of unnecessary, petty, meddling regulation that prevents it from competing effectively with big business. It's also why what passes for democracy in the European Union is like a building on a movie set, all front and no substance. Because when you're imposing a grand political plan on people, you can't just abolish democracy, or there might be riots. So you give them a kind of decaf version, where people are elected to a puppet parliament, an assembly of powerless political eunuchs who are not allowed to initiate any legislation or remove the government. And most of them are quite happy to go along with the charade because they're so well paid for it, obscenely well paid. Like everyone in hock to the European Union, they're effectively being bribed with our money. And the people who run things know that they can get away with this sham because they know that most of us are not really paying attention. After all, it's only Europe. But of course it's not Europe at all, is it? It's the European Union, an authoritarian political entity that's been superimposed on Europe by unscrupulous career politicians who have stolen Europe's good name. If you look into many of the people who are urging us to stay in, You'll find that they're motivated by grubby self-interest, whether it's a fat EU pension they don't want to lose, or a fat EU job that they've got their eye on, or a lucrative grant that they've been receiving, or some other kind of European Union money, meaning our money, that's going into their pocket. It's what we in Britain have come to know as the Kinnock Factor. Look into it yourself and you'll see. Recently, the worst US president in history arrived in Britain to lecture us and to threaten us if we leave the EU. In doing so, he showed himself to be as arrogant and dishonest as he is weak and incompetent, and nobody was a bit surprised. What he didn't tell us is that he wants us to stay in because he wants to push through a sinister trade deal with the European Union that will give American corporations the right to sue the British government if it passes laws that affect their profits. But the European Union at its core is not about trade. It's about power. Trade is the blindfold they've used from the beginning, and even now, in this referendum campaign, they're focusing obsessively on transient economic issues. You'll be better off, you'll be worse off by this amount, by that amount. Who knows and who cares? But suddenly, everybody is a clairvoyant to deflect our attention away from the real question, which is, who makes the laws that we have to live by, and how accountable are they directly to us? That's all that matters in this referendum, because everything else flows from that. If you can't remove the people who govern you, you live in a dictatorship, however many fancy labels and buttons and bows they dress it all up in. We cannot remove the people who run the European Union, no matter what they do, so they do what they want.
They remove elected governments whose policies they don't approve of. They overturn and ignore democratic ballots whose results they don't like. They break their own rules whenever it suits them with absolute impunity. And their fantasy currency has impoverished a whole generation in southern Europe where youth unemployment is now 50%. Everything they've touched has been a disaster. They couldn't have done a worse job if they purposely set out to screw things up. And we want to give these people even more power? Are we insane? They meddled in Ukraine and got Putin's attention. Now they want a European army to face him down, with them in charge, elected by nobody except each other. Their reckless insistence on wide open borders has turned a manageable refugee crisis into a full-scale illegal invasion by hundreds of thousands of fighting-age third-world Muslim men who never stop telling us how much they hate our society. And we can't deport any of them, no matter what they do, and they know that. And because none of them are screened in any way, Europe is now riddled with Islamic State terror cells. And everybody knows it's only a matter of time before the next massacre. The two countries that have opened their doors most widely, Sweden and Germany, are now plagued by an epidemic of migrant rape and sexual assault, while the police and the media do their best to cover it up. Soon all those men will have EU passports, and then they can come here and terrorise British women. And there's nothing that our miserable excuse for a government can do about it, because they've sold out our sovereignty to a bunch of unelected bureaucrats who don't have to care what we think about anything, because we've been left high and dry with no means of making them care. <laughs> Why would free people ever sign up to an arrangement like that, unless they were conned into it? And we were royally conned when we voted years ago for what we thought was a common market, what we thought was just a trading block. They swore up and down it would never develop into this kind of overarching, power-hungry political monster that now threatens our security and our freedom. We were conned back then and we're being conned now. This is a long con political coup that has taken decades to set up. And with this referendum, we are the mark who is just about to hand over their life savings. So maybe you're one of the people who hasn't quite decided yet how you're going to vote. But you think you might vote to stay in because it sounds more inclusive to be in than to be out and you can't really be bothered to investigate any further because, well, it's only Europe. Plus, you are a bit worried about what might happen if we leave, not that you really understand what it means, because you can't be bothered to find out. Well, don't worry, you're not alone. There are millions of people like you who are not paying attention, and you are the ones they're relying on to push this criminal scam through. They're hoping that you'll vote to stay in because you won't know what you're signing away and how permanent it is until it's too late. So if you don't usually engage with politics, God knows I don't blame you. But this is much more important than politics. This referendum is far more important than any general election that any of us have ever voted in or ever will vote in, and it deserves our serious attention. This is a moment in history that we have a responsibility to embrace, not just for ourselves, but for future generations, because the entire future direction of this country and of our society is now in our hands, maybe for the very last time. It's going to go in one of two very different directions, so how we vote here really matters. Do we want to live in a strong, free, independent country, governed by laws to which the people have consented, or do we want to be a province of a federal dictatorship where we do what we're told by unelected bureaucrats? When you sweep away all the speculation and verbiage, that is the choice. If we vote to remain, it'll be like willingly walking into a cage. A nice big cage with blue skies and little birds singing in the trees. But the cage is locked and you're not getting out. Welcome to the post-democratic era. It's no big secret. They've talked about it for years. We can't say that we weren't warned. But we will, won't we? When it finally dawns on us what we've done, we'll say, well, we didn't know. It's not our fault. We weren't paying attention. We couldn't be bothered to find out what was at stake until it was too late. Don't blame us. But future generations will blame us, and rightly so, for selling out their birthright, their right to democratic self-determination. It's so basic. It's so fundamental. We might as well be selling out their right to clean water and fresh air. Thanks to us, our children and grandchildren won't have a vote that counts. They won't have a voice. They won't be able to affect the society they live in or shape it in any way, and they'll be completely at the mercy of unelected, 
predatory career politicians. So please, this time, don't switch off the TV debates. Listen to the arguments. Pay attention to what's being said, because this time it does matter. And whatever you do, watch Brexit the movie online. I'll include a link below. I defy anyone to watch that and still want to remain in the European Union, which is why you won't see it on the BBC, as it sends the wrong message. It tells the truth. And please don't take my word for any of this. Find out for yourself what's at stake, but do it before you vote in the referendum, and then you won't get a nasty surprise when it's shoved into your face afterwards. Peace. Black and Asian people should come here in hundreds of millions. It's not right that for 500 years, imperialism has looted our country of all our wealth, has destroyed our country. We will come here, we have been coming here, and we will continue to come here in hundreds of millions until indeed Gaddafi said a Europe will turn black. <laughs> Diversity is now, in some parts of Europe, seen as a threat. Diversity comes with challenges. But diversity is humanity's destiny. There is not going to be, even in the remotest places of this planet, a nation that will not <coughs> see diversity in its future. In Jan Schelle war Nach dem jüdischen Gesetz musst du genau prüfen, ob Braut und Bräutigam wirklich jüdisch sind oder nicht. Hier in Israel kommen die Menschen aus tausend verschiedenen Ländern, Gott sei Dank. Aber wir müssen prüfen, wo sind deren Wurzeln. Wo sind heute die alten Ägypter, die alten Römer, die Spartaner? Wo sind sie? Mischmasch, durch Mischehen sind sie verschwunden. Welches Volk gibt es bis heute? Uns. Die Juden. Nur uns, angefangen mit Stammvater Abraham bis zum Ende der Welt. Nur Rabbiner dürfen Juden verheiraten. Muss das Gesetz geändert werden? Ja, natürlich. Hat das eine Chance? Nein. <lacht> More than 30,000 Israelis marched through Jerusalem's predominantly Palestinian old city on Sunday to commemorate the capture of the city's eastern sector in 1967. Security was tied with more than 2,000 police officers deployed. Most of those in the parade were ultranationalist Jewish youth. They started from the Muslim quarter of the old city before arriving at the western wall directly below the Al-Aqsa compound. The march, an annual event, comes amid a nearly nine-month-long wave of Israeli-Palestinian violence. And it was held as Muslims prepared to begin observing the fasting month of Ramadan, and many Palestinians visited the flashpoint Al-Aqsa Mosque. But no incidents were reported by nightfall. Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem has never been recognized by the international community, and Palestinians consider it as the capital of their state. And my answer to that is by ensuring that our values determine how we deal with diversity. This is the most important vote you will ever cast in your lifetime. So listen up. They're lying to you about Brexit. All this chicken little, the sky is falling. There'll be World War Three if Britain leaves the EU. There'll be economic catastrophe. It's all total bollocks. The EU isn't planning to become a federal superstate accountable only to the bureaucrats who profit from it. It already is one. It already has a central bank, a president, a currency, a criminal justice system, a passport, a flag, an anthem. These are all defining characteristics of a nation state. They lecture us all day about nationalism being evil, 
while trying to build a contrived pan-European nationality. Because it's not about free trade, it's not about peace, it's about obliterating the nation-state and replacing it with their own Byzantine United States of Europe and seizing raw power. They lied to us from the start. They claimed it was just going to be a free trade zone. It's already a sprawling empire. And isn't it an amazing coincidence that all the economic, academic, NGO and arts organisations who are fear-mongering about Britain leaving the EU are being bankrolled by the EU. The EU pays organisations to call for the EU to be given more power. The EU then seizes more power claiming it did so in response to popular demand. These are the same groups you now see all over the news claiming that Brexit will lead to the apocalypse. They're lying to you because they don't want their slush fund to come to an end. There's all this fear-mongering about massive job losses. The only job losses are going to be MEPs falling off the Brussels gravy train. The £3,500 a month general expenses, the business class refunds for budget flights, the €12,000 a month staff budget, the private shopping malls that aren't even open to the peasant public. And these MEPs don't even have to submit receipts. It's all a massive bribe to buy their obedience. EU officials pay a flat tax of just 21%. They're making decisions that have fiscal consequences for ordinary people, while themselves being exempt from those consequences. Power without responsibility. The ultimate form of authoritarianism. You've heard it said that the EU is undemocratic. It's not undemocratic, it's anti-democratic. Look at how the European Union responds when citizens in Europe vote to reject its mandates. In Denmark, Ireland, France, the Netherlands, Greece, the people voted to reject the Maastricht Treaty, to reject the Nice Treaty, to reject the EU Constitution to reject the Lisbon Treaty, to reject the Euro bailout. And every time the EU either made them vote again to get the result they wanted, or simply ignored the vote altogether. Listen to what Jean-Luc de Hearn, the former Belgian Prime Minister, said about a referendum on the EU Constitution. If the answer is no, the vote will probably have to be done again. Because it absolutely has to be a yes. Listen to what Jean-Claude Juncker, the current president of the EU Commission, said about the French referendum on the EU constitution. If it's a yes, we will say, on we go. And if it's a no, we will say, we continue. This is the same guy who said, quote, when it becomes serious... We have to lie. These people have nothing but contempt for your democratic rights. Look at the Eurozone bailouts. Under Article 125 of the EU's treaty, the bailouts were completely illegal. Under the EU's own rules, they were illegal. When Papandreou called for a referendum on the Greek bailout, he was turfed out and replaced with a Eurocrat. The same thing happened to Berlusconi when he said that the Euro had made Italians poorer. He survived a million scandals, but as soon as he defied the EU, he was gone. This is how they treat leaders who, God forbid, value the democratic rights of their own people. Juncker spelled it out when he said, quote, There can be no democratic choice against the European treaties. If the EU were a country applying to join itself, it would be rejected on the grounds of being insufficiently democratic. Look at the EU Commission. It's the EU's government as well as its legislative body. There's no separation whatsoever. Imagine the Obama White House writing a law to ban all guns and then passing it with virtually no input from Congress. That's practically how the EU operates. That's not a democratic institution. That's a tyranny. Why would we want to be part of an institution that's inherently anti-democratic? An institution that seeks to regulate and control every aspect of human behaviour. A complete insult to British common law, which holds that freedoms that are not explicitly prohibited are implicitly allowed. An institution whose Euro judges have declared that their decisions take precedence over national constitutions and parliaments. Do you want to live in a democracy or a technocracy? Do you want to have the power to remove the people that govern you? Or be at the whim of bureaucrats who you didn't even elect, being ruled by people whose names you don't even know? Do you recognise this man? No. No. <laughs> Do you recognise that man? No. I 
challenge you to name almost any of them. We sacrificed our democracy, our sovereignty, in return for promises of peace and prosperity. And this is what we got in return. MEPs who we don't even vote for. They're completely ceremonial. They have no power. The EU Parliament can't even propose or repeal laws. It's all done by unelected commissioners who scheme behind the scenes with lobbyists. Parliamentary democracy, once every five years, you can throw everything out of the window and start again. With this, once something is European law, there is nothing which would be a democratic process the voter can do to change it. The people whom we elect to go to Brussels have almost no power at all. They do what they're told. Got even less power than the House of Lords, for goodness sake. Our votes for these people are pointless. They are fundamentally pointless. We need to talk about immigration because the polls show that this is the issue that's going to swing this vote. So if you're enjoying the cultural enrichment that millions of Muslim migrants are bringing to Europe, then how about 75 million more? The EU is being blackmailed by Turkey to speed up its acceptance into the European Union. If that happens, 75 million Turks could eventually have the right to live in the UK. We've already got record net immigration. We're full. 333,000 immigrants pouring into the UK every single year, more than half of whom are from other EU countries. Double the number from EU countries that they first claimed. Now half a million more migrants from the Middle East and North Africa who have entered Europe over the past year could make their way to Britain from 2020 under EU free movement rules. If we continue down this path of political integration, EU mandated quotas could see us swamped with millions more Muslim migrants just like Germany. We won't be in a position to say no. This is already putting an incredible strain on our public services and the NHS. We've got a chronic housing shortage. We've got record homelessness. And thanks to the EU's open border policy, southern European states simply waved millions of migrants through, knowing that they would head to the northern European welfare states and would become someone else's burden. Now Sweden and Germany are making their own people homeless to accommodate migrants who have nothing but contempt for our culture. People from an aggressive and regressive belief system who hate the West even though we shower them with benefits. So unless you want parts of Britain to become Brussels-style radicalised Islamic ghettos, we need to take back control of our borders. Like any big government outfit, the EU also wants to import millions more people who will become dependent on big government. Why? Because they'll vote for more big government. Despite the official Leave campaign shying away from immigration, the polls show that this is the primary issue motivating voters. This is how we win, by putting immigration at the forefront where it deserves to be. The European Union is an economic basket case. Since 2010, every region in the world has experienced significant economic growth, except Europe. It's the sick man of the globe. The UK sends the EU £350 million a week, enough to build a new NHS hospital every single week. We get less than half of this back and have no control over how it's spent. Britain has paid more into the EU budget than she got back for 40 out of 41 years. We spent more than double on EU largesse than we saved from five years of austerity measures. Yet where are the mass protest movements on the left? It's no surprise how desperate the EU is for us to stay. We're propping up their entire failing system. As the disaster in Greece has shown, the EU is only economically as strong as its weakest member. Now countries like Albania and Serbia are about to join, so more of our money can be transferred over to them. This is just wealth confiscation on a continental scale. Look at how the EU's devastated the British fishing industry banning fishermen from operating on their own doorstep. These fish markets used to bustle with 12,000 boxes of fish a day. Now look at it, 200 boxes a day. We pay the price while countries that maintained their independence from the EU, like Norway, prosper. When Britain joined the common market, it lost control of its fishing grounds. When quotas were imposed, Several other European countries lobbied the EU for Britain's fishing rights to be divided up between them. The British government was powerless to stop this. 
the EU is just obliterated the English fishing industry altogether. The quota system they've got now is just, it's just mad. Local fishermen were now banned from fishing in waters they'd fished successfully for centuries. Oh, just beyond the pier over there. In fact, it, it might be there today, this great big Dutchman. Well, that Dutchman's got 25% of the whole quota of all of England. It's only three or four miles off the town catching heron and mackerel. Local fleet kind of catch heron and mackerel and it's right on the doorstep. There is still a prospering North Atlantic fishing industry, but only in countries that have retained their independence. Well, look at the Icelandics and the Faroes and the Norwegians. They sell millions of pounds worth of fish to us. And they're outside the common market. Well, you tell me a common market country that buys fish off us. But they send the fishing boats to the North Sea to catch our fish. And it's just madness. The EU has been paying British fishermen to destroy their boats. Inside the EU, Britain isn't even allowed to negotiate its own trade deals. It has to fall in line with the other 27 countries. But what's going to happen to British exports to the EU if we leave? The EU takes 55% of Swiss exports and 81% of Norwegian exports, both of which on in the EU. The EU isn't going to stop trading with us if we leave. They need us. We'd be their biggest export market. We'd also be free to sign trade deals with countries that are actually growing economically and not be bound by the EU ball and chain. But aren't we taking a huge leap into the unknown if we leave? Claim the Remain Camp fearmongers. Really? Well, look at Switzerland, the highest quality of life in the world, five times the exports of the UK, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world, low taxes, few regulations, a GDP twice as high as Britain, the same for wages, direct democracy. The people decide when there's a referendum, not the politicians. Switzerland still trades with the EU, and it doesn't have to apply any of their endless regulations domestically whereas Britain has to apply 100% of them. I mean, what's not to like? Switzerland has flourished precisely because it's not in the EU. Why can't we follow their example? Look at Iceland, same story. Look at Guernsey, its head of state is the Queen. It uses the pound, it has a parliamentary democracy. It has control over its own borders. It has a thriving economy, a high standard of living, crime, is virtually non-existent. Guernsey is not in the European Union. Why can't we follow their example? The EU is so fixated with regulating and controlling our every activity. They're now banning kettles, toasters, hair dryers, and light bulbs if they're not eco-friendly enough. Big corporations love the EU because they can afford to adopt its endless list of onerous regulations. This enables them to strangle their competition, the small and up-and-coming businesses whose growth is hindered by these regulations. Despite the fact that only 6% of their exports go to EU countries, small businesses in the UK have to comply with 100% of EU regulations. A salmon smoker in London had to pay thousands of pounds to comply with EU allergy regulations to say that his product contained fish. Gee, do you think the consumer would already know if they're buying salmon that it contains fish? Look at how the EU conspired with pharmaceutical companies to ban vitamin supplements. Only Big Pharma could afford to run all the safety tests, even though there was no safety issue in the first place. Independent herbalists couldn't afford those tests and they went out of business. Look at how the EU and big corporations conspired to switch cars over to diesel fuel to corner the market. Oh, but it was all for a good cause, a 15% reduction in CO2, because they really care about us. What they didn't tell you was that compared to petrol, diesel emits 22 times more pollutants that penetrate our lungs, brains, and hearts. For a crony capitalist deal, the EU imposed regulations 
that actually killed untold numbers of people. Why would we want to remain part of an institution that's designed to screw over small businesses and the middle class? Why wouldn't we want to leave an institution that jacks up our cost of living by slapping regulations and tariffs on everything that we consume? The EU's anemic economic growth has left its member states at the mercy of mass uprisings and civil unrest. That's why far-right extremist parties are now soaring in popularity. People are getting more desperate. Mass riots are now becoming more commonplace as a result of the EU's disastrous economic policies. So in what way does staying in the EU make us any safer? The Vote Leave campaign is based on sound arguments, facts, logic, statistics. The Vote Remain campaign is based on fear-mongering and hyperbole. Cameron saying there's going to be a new world war if we leave. Relying on people not knowing the difference between the EU and NATO. I mean, what an insult to your intelligence. Cameron saying that the leader of ISIS would support Brexit. I mean, what's next? Is Cameron going to claim that Satan himself is in favour of Britain leaving the EU? This is Project Fear. This proves that their arguments are baseless because all they can appeal to is irrational panic. They're relying on the tyranny of the status quo and people being psychologically averse to change. That's all they've got. They're so desperate. They're sending out instructions to voters telling them how to tick the remain box on the ballot. They're sending out referendum polling cards to non-British EU citizens who aren't supposed to be allowed to vote. Oh, but we need to remain in Europe to have an influence, they tell us. Really? Is that why since the late 80s, every time the UK voted against an EU legislative proposal, the UK lost the vote 70 times? Is that what you call influence? A vote to leave is a vote for the people. It's a vote for small business. It's a vote for lower taxes. It's a vote for cheaper household bills. It's a vote for lower fuel costs. It's a vote for cheaper food prices. Once we escape the burden of the odious common agricultural policy, it's a vote. To free ourselves of these shackles. It's a rejection of the obnoxious elites in Brussels getting fat off their thousands and thousands of pounds of taxpayer funded expenses. It's a rejection of an institution so authoritarian that it has brazenly rejected the democratic will of the European people time and time again. With general elections, it doesn't really matter who you vote for, Conservative or Labour, because you know that in four years' time, you can change your mind. This time, you can't change your mind. This time is for keeps. This referendum is the most important political act that has happened in my lifetime. This is about our future, our freedom, our democracy, our right to govern ourselves. What really matters is that you should have the power to remove the people who govern you. The reason why the suffragettes went to all that trouble to get the vote was because they wanted to, they themselves, be treated as grown-ups and decide their own destiny. How on earth does handing over more power and more money every single year to a failing, corrupt institution like the EU make Britain any stronger? In what universe is handing over control of our country to people who we didn't elect, who don't represent us, a good idea? To what problem? Is the EU a solution for your future, for your children's future, for the future of a free and prosperous Britain? On June 23rd, vote, leave. Hundreds of government supporters gathered on the streets of Garagas on June the 4th to repudiate the interference of the United States and the Secretary General of the Organization of American States in the Internal Affairs of Venezuela. Para nosotros la movilización del pueblo en la calle es, la, es el único lenguaje que entiende el fascismo, que entiende el imperialismo. Y por eso en el día de hoy, por ejemplo, hoy sábado 4, de junio tenemos en todo el país al pueblo en la calle. Protesters also shout slogans against the leadership of the National Assembly of Venezuela. 
which is dominated by the opposition coalition after the election in December last year. Venezuela is a country free and sovereign, and after 17 years of revolution, we are more free, more independent, and more sovereign than ever. We are particularly cautious as a people de la soberanía, de la independencia, de nuestra capacidad para resolver nuestros problemas. Earlier this week, OAS Secretary General Luis Alcmaglo called to invoke the organization's democratic charter to suspend Venezuela from the organization due to alleged human rights violation and lack of democracy. Of Palestinians in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip are marking the 49th anniversary of the Israeli invasion and military occupation of the territories that began in 1967. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said in a speech that Palestinians will not accept less than the end of the Israeli occupation and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state after 49 years of Israeli occupation. Abbas said East Jerusalem must be the capital of the Palestinian state. Israel occupied the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights of Syria, and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula in 1967. It pulled out from the Sinai following the 1978 peace treaty signed at Camp David with Egypt.